All right, we're going to watch this now, guys. One day the last star will die and the universe will turn dark forever. It will probably be a red dwarf, a tiny kind of star that's... Yeah, I think we think maybe about 100 trillion years. <laughs> but like, it's also worth saying, you know, this is a big think. There's lots of ways the universe might turn out and we don't actually know. So, you know, we, we think we know what's somewhat more likely at this point in time. If we just extrapolate, there's no guarantees that dark energy will continue to do what it's doing. Who knows? Also, one of our best bets to find alien life and might be the last home of humanity before the universe becomes uninhabitable. So what do we know about them? And why are they our last hope? At least 70% of stars in the universe are red dwarfs. They are the tiniest stars out there, with only about 7 to 50% of the mass of our Sun, not that much bigger than our planet Jupiter, which is still huge though. They are also very dim. It's impossible to see them with the naked eye. You've never seen one in the night sky. Even with all our technology, we can only clearly observe red dwarfs in our neighborhood. Approximately 20 of the 30 stars close to Earth are red dwarfs. Like all stars, Red dwarfs fuse hydrogen into helium. But while more massive stars accumulate all the fused helium in their cores, red dwarfs stay convective, meaning that the helium and hydrogen constantly mix. Keep in mind, you know, we like to talk in absolutes in science, but like the stuff he's describing, the stellar physics of red dwarfs is not exactly precise. You know, it's, we don't know. There's lots of things going on in our star, the sun, which is an average star that we still don't understand. The 11 year cycle, the poles, north, south, they flip. We don't understand this. There's so much about our own star that we don't understand, let alone red dwarfs. And there's so much going on in red dwarfs that's different. Um, for a long time, we thought life might not be able to like inhabit the planets around red dwarfs. We know there's planets around red dwarfs. There's lots to be learned there as well that we don't know, constantly learning. But we didn't think there'd be any life on those planets because they're very close, right? Because these stars are not as hot. But uh, we thought this as well because they're, they're kind of pretty close. And with all of the stellar activity going on and solar flares and the coronal mass ejections, with all the coronal mass ejections and flares, we thought it would just like destroy the planets that are quite close. But recently we've realized it looks like red dwarfs actually flare way more at their poles. Right? And, you know, planets usually around this plane. So the planets might be okay. There could be life. Actually, might be these systems might be great now. The optimal systems, because these stars are going to live for so long. But anyway, too much talking. So they use up their fuel incredibly slowly before they're extinguished. Red dwarfs burn so... Oh, yeah, maybe I should elaborate. When I'm <laughs> What I'm talking about is what's happening inside the star. So I'm not talking about um, what it like looks like, right? <laughs> like uh, we can see what it looks like. We can't, and you know, we can actually kind of see inside it in certain ways. There's something called like a, a stellar, there's like this stellar seis seismology, you know, seismology that we use with earthquakes, you know, vibrations through the ground. We can do that. There's things called uh, stellar like quakes, uh, star quakes, they're called. Uh, so we can use that to peer inside and you know, you might also know there's some forms of matter that rarely interact with other things uh, such as neutrinos and you know, the sun gives birth to some neutrinos that fly out and there's like you know, billions and a huge number of them flying through your body all the time and they can just travel through the earth, right? These things are just, they're very, very small and so they just don't interact much. They're the ghosts. And uh, so there are ways of potentially seeing inside, but I'm not also like to, to be able to use neutrinos to see things. Well, then you'd have to be able to detect them as well, which we currently are not good at. Like you should look into the experiments of how we detect neutrinos. It's crazy. You can detect them on the other side of the planet because they go through it. While more massive stars accumulate all the fused helium in their cores, red dwarfs stay convective, meaning that the helium and hydrogen constantly mix. So they use up their fuel in 
So like I was saying, we're, we're confident though, we have a good idea because it matches predictions. And the way we can actually look into this is with computational models. In our simulations, we can build models, put all the physics we think is going on in there, and it works, and it produces something in our simulations that matches what we see. And not only that, our simulations can tell us stuff we can't see, right? And that, that's a prediction. And those predictions are keep matching as we improve the simulations, like new things, and we learn. So you see what I'm saying now? Incredibly slowly before they're extinguished. Red dwarfs burn so slowly that their average lifespan is between 1 and 10 trillion years. By comparison, the sun will survive for another 5 billion years. Because the universe is only 13.75 billion years old, not a single red dwarf has reached later development stages. Every single one of the trillions that exist is still a baby. Speaking of babies, the smallest star in the entire universe is also a red dwarf because small red dwarfs are right on the verge of being a star at all. Just a tiny bit less hydrogen and they are mere brown dwarfs, failed stars that cannot sustain a fusion reaction for long. So what about aliens or a new home for humanity? Since our sun will die one day, we'll eventually need to look for a new home. And where there are habitable planets, there might also be aliens. The Kepler Space Observatory found that at least half of all red dwarfs host rock planets between half and four times the mass of our Earth. Many of them are in the habitable zone. Keep in mind, you know, limited sample size might not be detecting some of them. So you can't just say we know that only half have. We actually need to do more research and JWST will help a lot with this as well. Zone, the area around a star where water can be liquid. But since red dwarfs burn at relatively cold temperatures, a planet would need to be really close to be hospitable, probably as close as Mercury to our sun, or even closer. Which brings with it all kinds of problems. For example, a planet this close to a star would probably be tidally locked, meaning the same side would always face it. This side would be incredibly hot, while the shadow side would be frozen, which makes it hard for life to develop. Although a planet with a big enough ocean... Yeah, so you guys might have heard of the planet. I think we've talked about this recently as well. Um, Trappist. The Trappist system. You know, it's a planet which we think might resemble Earth quite a bit, but there's a problem with it. And it's that it's tidally locked, so it only shows one side to this star. Check this out. Trappist is so cool. It, there was, it was massive in the news when we discovered this system because we realized it had all these planets and there's like three that might... I think they're in the Goldilocks zone, and we're like, oh my god, uh, it's 40 light years. So, and I remember NASA released these really cool looking posters. I have this on a shirt. It's like massive. It looks sick. Guess what? You're probably going to miss all this. And it might just happen. It's a bit like how uh, people in caveman times, you know, are missing out on iPhones and, <laughs> you know, seeing stuff. But who really knows what's going on, you know? might be able to distribute the star's energy and create some kind of stability. All the gravitational forces of the red dwarf could squeeze the planet and heat it up so much that it might lose all its water over time. These planets could end up like Venus, a hot, burning hell. Another problem is that many red dwarfs vary in their energy output. They can be covered in star spots that can dim their emitted light by up to 40% for months, which would cause oceans on planets to freeze over. At other times, they can emit powerful solar flares, sudden outbursts of energy, incredibly powerful. These red dwarfs can double their brightness in minutes. Another thing to say about these solar flares, it's weird because these things are smaller and not as hot. The solar flares are actually like more intense and they're more frequent. It's like, come on, how does that make sense? <laughs> There's so much going on with the stellar physics here we do know about and like that I, I'm not mentioning it at all. If you go study astrophysics, they'll tell you all about it, like what you know, it's made of, because that we can know, um, you know, the way we, un we, we discover stuff about the universe is through light and light, you know, thanks to like quantum mechanical stuff, we can break it down into, you know, uh, you know, you've probably heard of spectra, right? The spectrum of things. So basically just know we can break up this spectrum. We can break up the light and from it, thanks to quantum mechanics, we can see what this thing is made of. Because in that light, there are things either missing or there are only these things. Emission absorption spectrums, right? 
And that tells us those things are there because they're like being absorbed or emitted from the thing over there. It's, re it's quite difficult to explain. And this has di directly ties into energy levels and like the way things at the atomic scale move around. Now, can you see why I suggested you guys yesterday, if you want to go into astrophysics, you're best off to study physics, right? Because if you want to understand stellar physics, that's just one area. You actually have to know what's going on in quantum mechanics if you want to know what's going on fundamentally. It, which could strip away sizable portions of a planet's atmosphere and burn it, rendering it sterile. On the Shebzilla. Yeah, no, you're completely right, man. I said this yesterday as well. I said, look, it could be something very soon, you know, in the next 10 years that we can, like, upload our consciousness. And you don't miss it. That's why I said maybe. And, like, you know, I always try to use maybes and likelies and this or that. On the other hand, their extremely long lifespan is a big plus. A red dwarf with just moderate levels of activity could be an amazing place for a planet that hosts life. Life on Earth has existed for about 4 billion years, and we have about a billion years left before the sun becomes so hot that complex life on Earth will become impossible. We will either die out or leave Earth and look for a new home. We could build a civilization for potentially trillions of years around a red dwarf with the right conditions. About 5% of the red dwarfs in the Milky Way may host habitable, roughly Earth-sized... That's a guess, right? Lots of guesses. <laughs> ...planet. That would be more than 4 billion in total. When I say guess, I mean like there's just no evidence to even know. That is a complete guess, right? This ties into all kinds of those fun things to think about. To do with aliens and the Fermi Paradox and the Drake Equation. But life may not even need a planet like Earth. Candidates for life around a red dwarf may be the moons of gas giants, also called super-Earths, really massive rocky planets. All in all, there are an estimated 60 billion potentially habitable planets around red dwarfs. And that's in the Milky Way alone. <laughs> so red so crazy. dwarfs might become really important for our survival in the future. But everything has to die at some point, even red dwarfs. When in trillions of years the life of the last red dwarf in the universe is about to end, it will not be a very spectacular event. As its hydrogen runs out, it shrinks, becoming a blue dwarf burning out completely. After its fuel is spent, it's transformed into a white dwarf, an object about as small as Earth, packed very densely and made of degenerate gases, mostly of helium-4 nuclei. Having no more source of energy, it will cool extremely slowly over trillions of years until it becomes its final form, a cold black dwarf. White and black dwarfs are so fascinating that they deserve their own video. Yes. Anyway, it's going to be a long time before the last stars in the universe vanish. It's kind of uplifting to know that if humanity succeeds in venturing into space, we have plenty of time before the universe turns out the lights. There's lots of time. That's that's true. Another great video by Kurzgesagt. Hope you guys enjoyed. And I will just say, just for the sake of the traditional video, which we'll probably edit this bit into the video, is I'm creating a post quantum VPN, and it's literally the first one available to the public, right? And this thing, you know, actually works, and you can use it for free right now. It's got like 11 locations, so go check it out in the description. And that will be for free.